Hi, everyone. How are you doing? <laughs> Woo! It's so good to be here. Thanks, Dougie. And I, I you know, the FBI is a, is a really great way to connect to people. Trust me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Andrew Hessel. I'm, I'm a cell biologist and a geneticist. And, and so I'm... This is me at work one day at Autodesk. It kind of captures the whole thing because I've got my cup of coffee, I've got a glass of wine, I've got my laptop, I've got a book. Um, <laughs> this was really a candid shot. I like to keep things balanced uh, or imbalanced. I don't really know. So I'm really the first genetic scientist Autodesk ever hired. Autodesk is a software company, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. But um, really, uh, to start you off, this is my favorite organism in the whole world. It's E. coli. It's the main <laughs> component of your guts. Um, it's digesting your dinner right now. I absolutely love this little organism. You never look at sausage the same way. But <laughs> I know, but it's so much fun. So I love this organism because I really love all organisms. I, I'm, I started in cell biology, so I work single cell up. This is just a cartoon of a eukaryotic cell, like one of yours. And I can tell you, this is really one of the most complex machines in the known universe. It is really thousands of components that works together. It's actually organized like a small city. And, and you know, there's a seat of government, there's waste management, there's transportation, there's energy systems. This is really an amazing machine, and you're just a lot of these amazing machines strung together. To give you a little sense of my world of cell biology, I want to take you into the world of the nanoscale and the microscale. These are things you can see with your eye pretty clearly, coffee beans, sesame seeds. As you start to zoom in, it, you know, you really run out of resolution pretty quickly. You know, below the grains of salt, you're starting to get into the larger cells single cells, the paramecium, the amoeba that you read about in school, the human egg, the skin cell. This is the world of, of the micro scale, and, and it is the, where these creatures live. When you start going down even smaller, you start going into the nanoscale, you start getting into the viruses, and as you keep diving in, then you start going into the actual components that make these, these creatures, these cells. So it gets really, really small. And I can tell you, all the physics down here is pretty much magical. Biophysics is different than conventional physics because it's basically magical fairy dust. <laughs> this is the coolest thing about all living cells, though. They duplicate. This is E. coli growing kind of, you know, in, in, in its fastest mode. And it'll double at about every 15 minutes. It'll produce a new offspring. So you start with one bacterium. Overnight, you end up with billions and billions of creatures. This is what I love about these organisms. Our cells, this is a macrophage attacking uh, some bacteria, will actually, you know, they win because they're like billions of years more complicated. They can actually go and eat, you know, hunt down the bacteria, engulf them, digest them, just eat them for dinner. This is why you exist and the bacteria are just helping you out rather than taking over. Um, you know, cell biology is absolutely amazing stuff. Cells are, in fact, micron scale, self-assembling data processors. They're really fully networked computers and 3D printers. They make literally thousands and thousands of compounds. So this is why I think cells are even cooler than 3D printed metals. <laughs> now, let me get to this. But it's all about networks anyway. So if you start with the cell and go smaller, you're down into the components. And in fact, they're pretty much what you're used to in terms of electronic systems or hardware, software. You really do get down into circuits and components. If you move upwards, you're going up into networks. Again, cells turn into tissues. They turn into organs. They turn into organisms. They turn into ecosystems. But it's really all just networks. So I don't really talk biology to anyone anymore. I just talk computers and networks because that's what everyone's familiar with. Really, the language of biology is so arcane, it's, it's really tough. The cool thing is, if you take an E. coli or even your own cells and you squish it, the DNA comes out. Um, with E. coli, <laughs> it's actually not that much information. It's only about four and a half million bits of information. So it's like a photo on your phone. Um, we have six billion bits of information. It's a little more complicated. But, but really, this is, when, I, when I saw this, this was just like unspooling a cassette tape, if you remember what those things were. So, you know, 
really compact. So a living creature, four and a half million bits of information, it's really compact. So that I wanted to sequence this organism. I ended up working doing mapping for a long time. The cool thing is I recognize, I come from a background of computer programming, is that DNA is the programming language for life. It's not one of the programming languages, it's the programming language. And you know, so if you learn this one language, you can basically, r you know, program any living organism or any component thereof or any aggregation of these living cells that you can think of. And this is, this is amazing. We have to learn how to do this. Now, this is the basic wiring diagram of a eukaryotic cell. <laughs> it's basically spaghetti on a wall. And believe me, it only gets more complex from here. We really don't understand much about living cells yet. And this is kind of humbling because we know a lot about a lot of other things. But life is still pretty mysterious. Um, this is my reading material. This is my Bible. It's an 1,800-page guide, you know, like instruction set for, you know, the molecular biology of one cell. Um, and then hooray for fish is because I have my daughter and my wife back here. And I've been learning a lot about self-assembling systems. But today, it's kind of fashionable to learn a lot about cells. Paul Allen from Microsoft uh, just recently announced that he's got a whole new cell science institute. Again, this is to really crank up the science and research on, on these single cells because they're so mysterious and yet so vital for what we do. If you if you kind of if you're a scientist, you kind of recognize the laboratory. It hasn't changed that much in a hundred years. This is a, a microbiology laboratory, turn of the century. This is a little more recent, but it's basically the same, except we threw away all the glassware and and put in plasticware because no one likes to do dishes. It's really, but this is a complex kitchen. It's really hard to learn how to cook in these things. All of the ingredients you're buying uh, from Sigma, not Whole Foods, really expensive. Um, it, there's a big barrier to doing this work. This is what I love. There is, DNA has become a push button technology. We have 3D printers for the DNA molecule now. And I just wanna, I just wanna emphasize that. You can 3D print the DNA molecule. Now, it's not called a 3D printer, it's called a DNA synthesizer, but that's exactly what this machine, machine is. You, you can program it, it spits out DNA. So suddenly, molecular biology and genetic engineering has become a push-button technology. It's gotten really easy. And now you can write some genetic code and send it to a group like Gen9 in Boston or Twist Biosciences in the Bay Area, and you can print DNA at scale, and it's cheap. So this is a whole, this is like G-code for your cellular 3D printer. And it's absolutely amazing that we have this technology today. This is twist technology. They've actually gone away from plastic and they've started making all of their plasticware, so to speak, out of silicon. So now in the space where you could only make one thing, you can make thousands and thousands of little tubes and, and it just totally scales up the types of chemistries that they're doing. It's pretty fantastic. More than that, we're coupling DNA printers with robotic labs. This is a company called Transcriptic in Menlo Park. And basically, they've, they've built a cloud-based robotic lab. The CEO is a guy named Max Hodak. He's 25 years old, absolutely brilliant. And, and now, they've, now they've essentially made the entire science lab available through your laptop. And this is changing the game. More than that, anything you make in that lab, you can now send out for further testing with groups like Science Exchange, where you can hire scientists who, by the way, are always needing money. Always. <laughs> you can hire scientists around the world to actually do follow-up experiments. So the entire process of doing science has now become kind of in the cloud. This is a fundamental shift in infrastructure. Absolutely fundamental. And we've seen it before. We saw it with computing. Do you remember e-commerce websites, 1995? Like, you had to spend about $20 million to set up an e-commerce website. Today, it's free. This is the infrastructure change, and it, it, it's radical, and it changes economies. And this is what we're seeing in life science. And this brings me back to Autodesk, because Autodesk met me in 2009, I guess. I walked into the gallery space we have in San Francisco. I walked around. I looked at all the amazing things people make with our software, buildings and motorcycles and cars and airplanes, et cetera. And I realized, hmm, they all have something in common. And I went up to the CEO and I said, hey, you know, this is really fantastic, but all this stuff is dead. Don't you want to make living things too? 
<laughs> and he said yes, <laughs> which was amazing. So now they actually have a group dedicated to that. Now Autodesk, I, I, I just have to like show you some of this. Because we do so many things, I can't keep track of it. I don't do anything reverse looking, but we basically make all these tools that allow people to design, simulate, and build things even before they're built. You know, like this is, this is really bizarre. And it's used a lot in Hollywood because of course, if you can make unreal things, it's great for special effects in movies. But there's the breadth and scale of stuff that we do is really amazing. And the company has been changing so remarkably because today everyone is a maker. Like, because you have design tools that are getting more powerful and cheaper, coupled to things like 3D printers, and kids love this stuff, we're seeing the whole business change that, you know, CAD CAM is revolutionizing the world. So Autodesk has a facility up in San Francisco called Pier 9, which, where we just put artists sitting down in front of these, you know, the software tools, using these amazing printers, additive and subtractive, and they're just going crazy, experimenting and pushing the limits on this stuff. And more than that, we started giving away all of our software to every student, every faculty member around the world. So I'm just having a blast here. But, <laughs> but I'm the thin edge of the wedge. You know, like we have a group called Bio Nano Programmable Matter. Now bio you've got, because you're biological. Nano is just that little small stuff I was telling you about. Programmable matter, you need a few drinks. Like you really do. But it's really CAD CAM, Computer Aided Design and Manufacturing for Bio Nano. And, and it's really bizarre. I can tell you we're probably the only you know, design company in the world, software design company, that has its own bio lab and is starting to hack things. And it's really fun. Now, it's actually hard to design biology today. Again, we're, we're still reverse engineering, not forward engineering. We're still trying to figure out how it works. But the stuff where a lot of people are focusing right now is on viruses, single-celled bacteria, and the more commonly used and understood single-celled organism, the yeast. And if you're drinking here today, thank the yeast. If you've ever had a loaf of bread, thank the yeast. <laughs> what I've been working on, though, is these little critters. This is a, a little bacteriophage, a virus that infects bacteria. And it was actually first synthesized over, th over 12 years ago. But this little critter is kind of cool. It's 5,386 bits. And I got really hooked on the idea of making synthetic viruses. Now, you can 3D print them really, really easily. But you can also, today, print the entire viral genome using some of these synthesis companies. And booting them up is actually pretty easy. So I made Autodesk's first synthetic organism last year, which kind of woke them up. And they realized, oh, wow, we can actually do more than just build dead things. We really can build these living things. So this is just an E. coli growth plate. Wherever you see a spot is where a synthetic virus booted up and started killing bacteria. This was kind of fun. It was designed by a Stanford professor, Paul Jaschke. It only took two weeks to make this genome and boot it up for about $1,000. And today, I can do it for about $100. Next year, it'll cost me about a dollar. And that's why I end up meeting and working with the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> because this is harmless, but you really don't want some kid booting up Ebola, right? So yeah, so this is kind of a game changer. But you know, people tend to think of the negatives with viruses, but there's so many positives. Like you can make gene therapies, you can make antibiotics, you can make new materials, you can do cancer drugs. It's really fantastic. But the cool part was this project got accepted into the MoMA, so it's like actually art, yay. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> and the thing is, you can use DNA for just about anything. You can actually use it as a structural material. So now we're actually kind of working with these really cool scientists. Sean Douglas is one of them, but they actually use DNA as a structural material because we understand the physics of it so well. And this is actually a little cancer-fighting nanorobot that Sean designed. There's so much engineering that's going to go into this area because this is, again, all 3D printed nanoscale stuff. Totally cool. And of course, if you like 3D printing, well, you can actually use 3D printers to make biological things. You can have them poop out cells, boop, 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 and make synthetic tissues. People are doing that. They're trying to make synthetic meats and leathers, which is awesome. Here, we're actually 3D printing all sorts of biological structural materials, and we're actually 3D printing glass. 
because some organisms actually make glass at room temperatures, which is really bizarre, because normally you need a furnace. So we're, we're playing with all of these different areas and having so much fun right now. We don't know where it'll go. But I know this. You know, if you look back at Radio Shack ads in the 1990s, just about everything on this page is your cell phone now does, and that's because software is eating the world, as Andreessen Horowitz likes to say. But it's, software is also eating the world of, of the lab. The lab is going away. You know, today you can do most of this stuff just sitting in front of the computer. <laughs> faster, better, cheaper when it's applied to biology is faster, better, <laughs> cheaper, weirder. Because really everyone freaks out when you say manipulate, you know, a base pair of DNA or monkey with an organism, even though I can go produce babies. Anyways. This was one of the projects that kind of shook everyone a couple of years ago. A, you know, a, a group that just said, we're going to go make a glow-in-the-dark ornamental plant. They put it on Kickstarter. They raised you know, almost a half million dollars, got 8,400 backers. Today, you can go and do this same work by the same guy uh, as, out, as an outsourced service. For 20 grand, he'll make you any bioengineered plant you want. So if you want to start your own little Monsanto, just give him a call. I became an advisor to this company. I chased them down and, you know, please make me an advisor. Because these guys just were a couple of Indian scientists that said, we don't want, we want milk and we're vegan. So they said, we're going to re-engineer yeast to make m milk proteins. So instead of making beer, they can make all the milk they want. And trust me, I want breast milk because formula is scary shit. Anyways. So I love this company, and I can explain the technology to anyone. It's milk. This is great. But I also invested in a company called Hyacinth, which is porting all of the code from cannabis to yeast as well, which is, so we're going to get some really interesting beers. <laughs> get your cards, people. <laughs> this is another one I love. You know. <laughs> This is so cool. Nothing has to go extinct anymore because now we know how to bank DNA and we can also go and recover DNA from things that were recently deceased, you know, including the woolly mammoth. So this is a, definitely an organization to watch. It's, it's part of the Long Now Foundation, another, you know, really awesome technology series um, by some of, you know, by Stuart Brand and Ryan Phelan, just really incredible people. And so, you know, keep an eye out for the passenger pigeon coming back, the woolly mammoth, Elvis, whatever. Um, <laughs> but it's only getting weirder. You probably saw this news a couple weeks ago. The Chinese announced that they had actually engineered human embryos with a little technology called CRISPR, which is like a cut and paste technology for, you know, for genetics. So now we can do genetic surgery. This is really a game changer, folks. I don't know where it goes. I really don't. All I know is you have to start engaging with it and thinking about it because we've really created a new branch to the tree of life called Synthetica. This is by Daisy Ginsburg, an artist in London. Um, and, and, you know, it's just, it's the future of fabrication. It really is. And I know this, if you're in a co-working space like this, or a Starbucks, or even at home, and you've got yourself connected to a laptop, you can do this stuff. So learn, enjoy, explore, and uh, don't have the FBI knock on your door. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>